Let's start with a person right left of me, and that is Marcello Lu. Maybe you raise your hand, Marcello. Senior Vice President, Care Chemicals North America at BSF Corporation. And then we have uh, Greg Norris, Director of Sustainability and Health Initiative for Net Positive Enterprise at MIT. Then we go on to Mac Yoshi. Um, he's a Director of Strategy, Innovation, and Standards at Schneider Electric. And last but not least, um, Patrick Sheridan, Global Head, Digital Sustainability at Syngenta. Well, welcome up all, and a brief applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I would just like to say, as an obvious disclaimer, that, that we were going to have a bit more diversity, gender-wise, in the uh, panel, but certain people dropped out. So this is the, the, the circumstance. <laughs> that is no reflection on the quality of the participants today on this. And, and uh, I am, I'm just going to, to briefly explain. My talk was on, on, on KPIs. This talk really is about aligning digital transformation with what are the emergent KPIs of ESG and, in particular, net zero. Net zero is, for many organizations, becoming a key performance indicator of <coughs> environmental responsibility, sustainability, and you know, given uh, uh, certain threats when associates going on in terms of energy supply in Europe, you know, uh, um, quality of life. So, um, what we're going to do is do a quick round of questions um, so that you get a better understanding of the individuals and their organizations along how their organizations are confronting these challenges and opportunities in, in a digital context. And we're going to have a conversation. And in about 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to go right back to the, to the questions, your questions on, on this. So um, I do think I want to, to start with Marcelo. And we'll just run through. Um, what's the most important thing that this audience needs to understand about your organization's ESG efforts? and net zero efforts, given the non-trivial investment that VSF has made in, in uh, digital transformation. Yeah. Well, so first of all, thanks for the invite. Um, for us, being a manufacturing company and being right in the middle of a lot of different value chains, I mean, we, we provide uh, materials that go into many different industries, from pharma all the way to electric vehicles to uh, even oil and gas uh, exploration. Uh, for us, it's very important, you know, how we source it. So that's one degree of metrics that we've been put in place, ESG metrics, responsible sourcing, so of the material, how we're, how we're sourcing, do we audit our suppliers, so a lot of these siloed KPIs, which I, which I really enjoy. Uh, uh, the, the, the manufacturing, how we are manufacturing, are we really uh, going to the next level as far as reducing our emissions, uh, pushing efficiency in our factories, and then really, are we providing the products that are helping our customers, uh, and, and finally the end consumers reduce, you know, their uh, let's say ESG weight uh, but, as far as. But the quick follow-up on this is, you yeah. know, because I know that BASF has really taken IoT issues very seriously. How has there been explicit linking between the way BASF, which is humongous on every dimension one can imagine in terms of scale and, and sophistication of technology and, and, and product delivery. How are you using digital yeah. to, to enable th this? Is, is it in parallel or is ESG part of, is there a, 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 an ESG net zero line on every single digital budget in BASF? Yeah, um, I, I will say that goes from R&D all the way to product, but maybe I give one example where maybe it ties it all up. Great. Huh? Um, so so in, in my particular unit, uh, um, which we also deal with cosmetics, there's a lot of discussion around how you're sourcing this natural ingredient. Right. Is it, is it triggering deforestation and all these things? So we actually partnered with a startup, uh, at which we are scaling this up now, where essentially what you have is a, a blowing up of the supply chain uh, that is made available of you all the way from the farmers all the way to the end consumers. And with a QR code, you imagine you go into a store, you, you, you put on the QR code, it blows up the whole supply chain. Uh, Transparency. Really, transparent, great, great point. The two T's, which is very important. So maybe I summarize it this way. Transparency, but also traceability. 
Sometimes you have one, but you don't have the other, and we are trying to do both, yeah? And then in a supply chain, you put and it And digital on, is your key to doing both. You put it on blockchain, it's, it's, uh, it's audible, and you know, one of the fun things about it is that you create a storyline that then co consumers can use. And, and the example that we have is, you know, uh, uh, this technology that, uh, that we uh, sourced, uh, they did this for coffee, and you imagine you go to a coffee shop, you scan the code, it blows up the supply chain up to the farmer that harvested the coffee, and instead of just uh, you know, providing a tip to the barista, you can actually monetarily interact also with, uh, with the actual person that farmed. So that, that link of customer, product, and the source becomes very important. And that's how you try to tell the narrative around ESG. Very good, very good. So, so Greg, that, that sounds like the kind of handprint issue that you're pursuing. But you should explain, because Greg is with, with MIT, not a, a business person per se, but you have developed a very comprehensive framework, the Sunshine Framework on this, which you should share. Well, thanks. I, you're right. I, I love that example. And, and uh, you're absolutely right, too, that it's uh, the opportunity for a great handprint. And it, it just as you ask, you know, what's one thing that you'd like to share right at the kickoff? Right. Probably worthwhile to just explain what is that handprint idea and how does it sit beside the, the well-known footprint idea, footprints, negative impacts that we're trying to minimize or even get Footprints to are bad. Exactly. Footprints are bad. I, I tried to say this actually a couple of weeks ago at a shoe industry meeting ah. and it was, it, believe it or not, they were even on board by the end, but it, it maybe took a little more work. They're, but anyway. now, they're now making gloves, so. <laughs> They, um, well, they're into regenerative impacts, you know, they were into uh, impacts that production activities that actually not only have a lower and lower footprint, but are creating positive change. The handprint is positive change relative to business as usual in the same footprint. Metric. How do you measure that? Well, it starts by using the same approach as LCA, life cycle assessment. So you're using life cycle assessment to help you with your footprint. You're, you're now, you need a base case, and you show how the LCA that you've been a cause of bringing about, this change, this different scenario from the base case, has a lower footprint. That's the start. But the, the other piece of it is there are other causal pathways besides the ones that are already brought to you in the footprint. There's ripple effects, there's influence uh, on, uh, on decision making by actors across the value chain, and there's also reduction in impacts that lie outside of your footprint. If you have a supplier who's supplying many customers besides you, and you're a cause of them, let's say, switching to renewable energy, um, then you've actually greened your own footprint, but you've also created some, some progress outside your footprint, and hand printing brings What's that the in. most important thing you want people in this audience to understand about your organization at MIT, though? Well, we have been developing and articulating this framework of hand printing now for about five years. We've been aligning our terminology and our concepts and our data with existing um, frameworks like WRI, GHG protocol, and the Science-Based Targets Initiative and so on. We're switching our mode of action now. We, we feel that the, the framework is there and it's being taken up these ideas beyond value chain uh, mitigation have been taken up more broadly. So we're switching into the role of an incubator for handprint creation. Very good. So, Mark Schneider has been a pioneer on these things, on digitalization and running Knox network operating centers. What's the most important thing people in this audience should understand about what Schneider Electric has been doing and plans to do, particularly in the context of infrastructure and energy, where people are realizing that the energy transition may come at a greater cost of discomfort than they might have expected. Yeah, absolutely. Once again, thank you for the opportunity and uh, thanks for having me here. So yeah, so, so folks that don't know Schneider Electric, we're uh, you know, 120, 130,000 people, global company. And we see ESG largely and sustainability as both a responsibility as well as an opportunity. And you know, fundamentally the driver behind uh, the motivation and the approach is that it has to be just, the en energy transition has to be a just energy transition, which means it has to be fair, right? We know that the, you know, the under, uh, underprivileged economies are hurt more by, by the climate action. And so whatever actions we take should be allowing opportunities for those 
those people to, to, to be able to take advantage of. But fundamentally, you know, we believe that we want to empower everyone to make the most of their energy and resources. And we want to do that with by monitoring some specific, you talked a little bit about the, about the metrics and right. we have some long-term goals, we established six long-term goals. But you should talk about goals. how Schneider, which used to be an equipment maker, you, you instrument everything. Your, your, your ability to do not just descriptive, but predictive and subsequently prescriptive analytics yes. is huge and you make a non-trivial sum of money off of that. So if you could talk a bit about that. Evolution. Absolutely, so, so uh, we see the world definitely going to become more digital and more electric, uh, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, the industrial environment where, you know, things are getting more automated, you know, you're getting software deployed. Uh, we talked a little bit, uh, we heard a little bit earlier in the few narratives about how software is adding more flexibility uh, through digitization. You're going to have a lot more measurability, measurability more visibility. Uh, and in all of that is going to lead to more energy footprint, right? So. Fundamentally, what that means is you have to be able to understand where the value is. You have to be able to invest in both, not just profits for, for the growth sake, but profit driven by a purpose. And the purpose has to elevate all the people that are been going to benefit from that as well. You're being a little too PC here, but we'll come no. back with more difficult <laughs> questions in a moment. On, on, so, on, uh, on, on, on Syngenta, agriculture, I was reading a piece in the Financial Times just the other week where where people are coming after agriculture more and more. You know, it's back to the, to the, the horrors of the Green Re Revolution and Norm Barlog, instead of being a Nobel Prize winning saint, mm. is evil on this. And now organizations like Syngenta are coming into the crosshairs in this regard. But, it, but in fact, there are all manner of things that you explicitly call out and offer in sustainability throughout this cycle. Tell us what's been the biggest change over the last couple of years and the way you measure and communicate how you're investing in sustainability in this agricultural sector, which generates from you know, very cost intensive and technology intensive to you know, village farming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I think it's important to appreciate most of our, or many of our KPIs or commitments are actually uh, in the space of our growers. So when you think agriculture is a massive industry, right. 25 to 30 percent of the world's greenhouse gas footprint is agriculture, the food system. And if we were just to look at Syngenta as a company, we'd probably not really tackle the real problem. So most of our, our commitments are actually, uh, for example, uh, restore degraded land. We have 300 million hectares of degraded land worldwide that we can restore, which would have a massive impact on, the, say, the climate footprint. What's the definition of restoration? Uh, it's a productivity definition. Okay where we would say now the, the, the piece of land generates X calories, but the potential is Y. We need to get it from X to Y, because if you don't, you need more land, and clearing land is actually not the... And you can show through simulation, or not a digital, but a simulated field, a field in the metaverse, that going from that X to Y, that the total cost of energy investment, et cetera, that, that net net, you will be carbon zero. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we actually... When, when did you start doing that? <laughs> Probably 10 years ago. Um, we made some serious commitments, and uh, another one is biodiversity, so we're committed to uh, improving or protecting biodiversity on 3 million hectares a year um, through our products. And that's how we measure success as a company, is not have we reduced our footprint. I mean, our footprint is relatively small compared to agriculture's footprint. Of course, we have commitments there of as course. well. But it's really... How do we improve agriculture as an industry, as a sector, towards climate neutrality? What happens when your growers say, I, I want to save the world, but you know, it's a bit of a drought and I, I, I need to keep my, my, uh, my farm, my, my land going on this. Yeah, so yeah. can you cut us a break? Uh, actually, the break is not needed in most cases because what we propose is actually profitable. So we always look at a couple of dimensions, not just climate or biodiversity. We also look at what's the social impact and what's the economic impact or benefit. So in all our programs, we can demonstrate economic benefit for the grower. So you do that modeling? For yes. Them. Can they play with it themselves? No. No. Okay. We don't have grower my, facing my my, my prediction is that, that you open. My prediction is you open source that by 2025. 
Yeah, we have a couple of uh, initiatives where we're actually open sourcing the IP. I mean, really the complete IP and growers can, can play with this. Uh, we're, we're deploying, um, I think in previous conversation, the, the term was simplicity. How do you make right. things simple? We want to make sustainability simple for growers, so we're deploying in the U.S. apps that allow growers to model their own farm, where they can identify opportunities to improve sustainability, and this includes the economics. Very good. Marcelo, is BASF doing comparable stuff? Open source allowing your suppliers and your customers to model the environmental impact of the, the chemicals you sell, both the commodity and the specialty chemicals that you yeah, sell. Yeah, and maybe I address uh, something that is, I think, common to Please. A, everybody here. It's uh, common language, right? You, you mentioned this in your KPI talk. I mean, a lot of us are creating our own KPIs. I mean, right. at one point we had what we call triple S, uh, sustainable solutions steering and we labeled our products to say this is the most sustainable one and this is maybe the ones that we want to transition out of but nobody else used this and and this becomes a challenge right how do you do this so first thing is really providing that common language so what we did and we believe that in a little bit of this open source or consortium uh, setup uh, uh, we actually co-established or co-founded uh, what is called value balancing alliance can so you repeat that value balancing alliance Very good. So basically what that is, is a bunch of companies uh, that are coming together and saying this is the new standard way of trying to uh, come up with data that is ESG wise. Do you do, so your, do you do that with a Fraunhofer Institute? Do you do it with the government or is that purely private coalition? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, actually, it's, it's, uh, Harvard is included in there. Not Shame MIT. on you for saying yeah, Harvard. But I, 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 I had to do that, but, but actually... This proves that this wasn't prepared. Okay? Yeah, so it yeah. wasn't prepared. <laughs> but, but, so we have academics in there. Yeah. We also have uh, companies. It is now focused on Europe. Uh, actually, this alliance of, uh, I think it's now 20 plus companies, has, asked, has been asked by the European Commission uh, as part of the Green Deal that they use this as, let's say, the basis of how they will start really uh, uh, auditing ESG metrics. So the whole discussion about common language and how to really measure performance or pre do performance management is, is really coming to terms on establishing this common language. So we, as, as you know, a, a company that is in the middle of a value chain, uh, we have our impact, but you know we generate a lot more impact on how we source and how we sell and how our products are used. It's it's very important that everybody start using the same thing. Otherwise, we are measuring things garbage in, garbage out right. type of topic. Yeah. So, Greg, this is one of the interesting challenges that that academics have in particular, because as we know from the internet, which is you know bits, not mm -hmm. atoms, not not chemicals. Uh, once you have a standard, sometimes it slows innovation and, you know, it takes time to get people to calibrate and perhaps you're losing opportunities for sustainability or renewability or reusability. What guidance do you have from your experience about how you strike a balance between standard setting but still permitting or encouraging innovative and more dynamic metrics and measures around ESG and, and net zero? Right. Well, I think uh, I'll start by saying I've been teaching life cycle assessment at Harvard, as a matter of fact, for, for about 20 years. Um, and when the ISO, when, when ISO standardized LCA, right. I was a fresh grad student, I was really opposed because I felt there was so much innovation needed in life cycle assessment on metrics, as you say, on mm -hmm. the science and so forth. I, I really thought that was a, um, a shame. And I was proven wrong, thankfully. I think the, the ISO standards for LCA, in that case, they, they established a lot of uh, relatively high bars of transparency, of credibility, verification, um, scientific rigor. But they didn't say, this is how you do it. So it allowed for the science to continue to very evolve. Good. By the way, it's very, very unusual for a Harvard grad student to acknowledge that they were wrong. So this is a, a good way. But, but more. More seriously, uh, I, I would like to know, when did you come, what made you come to that realization? Because this is literally what you're doing now in terms of frameworks, and you presumably don't want your framework to undermine right. the dynamism of the people who choose to adopt it. So right. what heuristics or rules or guidance do you offer coalitions and larger organizations? On, on striking a balance between, here's how we do life cycle assessment, yeah. but, but even if we do it this way, you, you should still be doing this kind of experiment or this kind of partnership or this mm. kind of revisiting of a fundamental. Boy, I, 
I have to admit that in life cycle assessment, uh, the standards have not been a barrier to change, but brains have been. Okay. Human brains, um, I, I had a, uh, th there was a conference where I was proposing a, a, a new way of doing, uh, of modeling the consequences of changes in electricity demand. Um, it, it happens to be from attributional modeling to consequential modeling. For, that's fine. For those that's good. And Mark, one will, of the, Mark will give you comments on that afterward because that's probably what they're doing. Yes, go ahead. The thing that uh, happened in that conference is one of the founders of the field asked me, are you saying that what I've been doing for the past 30 years is wrong? And I was, you know, I was a friend of his. I'd spent the night at his house before, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, you know, things evolve. Science evolved, methods evolved. Those were, the, that was a valuable thing to do. But he never changed. Um, and the movement from this, I, I am seeing innovation. I am seeing people finally, enough papers being published to say, you know, with electric vehicles, we have to look at the marginal effects, not the average effects. That realization has finally come. but. I, I don't know what brought it about, except um, when people can show a better answer and it's accessible for use, that use seems to get widespread. I think it was Mach who said that, that progress in science happens one, one funeral at a time. Mm. Well. Uh, <laughs> no, you said well, not, not, no, 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 not Mach, you, Mach, M-A-C-H, yeah. Mach, the German physicist. I'm, Different spelling, different uh, background. But what is your reaction? Because, because uh, Schneider really did transform in every meaning of the phrase as, yeah, as, as, as a company. No. And how do you deal, how did Trichet deal with these, these kinds of legacy? One of my questions was on the nature of resistance. How have you, I mean, you've been there long enough to, where, where has the resistance, what is the source of resistance? Where has it been successful? And where have the results effectively squashed resistance? And where have people just had to be fired? Yeah, I mean, I, let me just begin to, to, to kind of reiterate some of the points I was making in a previous question, which Schneider established a sustainability monitoring and indicator measurement and public uh, sharing of this information since 2005. Yeah. So we've been at this for quite some time. Yes. We've been publicly monitoring all the KPIs. We've established a sort of commitment for six key areas around climate, around resources, around trust, how our employees are confident to come out and talk about unethical things, how we establish trust with our suppliers, with our customers, right? Um, we're talking about a variety of other things in, in the sense of, you know, making sure that the generations, the next generation is involved. We hire a lot of young, young people as well. We hire locally and we go into local communities and ensure that uh, are the measures we take from ESG. I'll give you one specific example, is that a lot of the equipment, electrical equipment that we build require you know, components right. uh, of, of specific material type that, right. require, that, that needs to go through arduous conditions. And fishing nets, there's 600,000 tons of fishing nets globally that are in the sea uh, that, you know, that are waste. They can be, we found working with a startup that they can be uh, wow. pulled out and materials can be created out of that that are now being used in our, our, our devices. So one, we went to a local community in India that was able to create local jobs as well as create this innovation that has allowed us to sort of, uh, you know, use the recycled materials. And this whole circularity aspect of it is quite Just let me step back. Well. So you, just for the entire panel, this, this notion of, quote unquote, the circular economy is a, a meaningful, reasonable template that you will frame Absolutely. business cases and legislative testimony around. You, you buy into that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think so. I think it's a strong argument, and, and, and I think it, it serves both, both sides, right? It serves the profit for the good cause, yeah. Just one quick follow-up before, before going um, to Syngenta here. You, talk, you, you seem to stress the importance of generational aspects of this. Is one of the ways you are overcoming legacy resistance is simply by hiring a generation that grew up with an expectation, indeed a demand, that environmental issues be explicitly addressed and be a part of enterprise purpose. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's a way to address the resistance as much as it is what makes us attractive to that generation. I think people want to work at places where they identify with, with a purpose. And purpose is what I started my presentation right. with. So, you know, we're all about purpose and a meaningful purpose drives people not only to come to work, but also 
you know, hire their friends, but also be committed to their work. Uh, and, and, you know, from our points of view, you know, those are ways to win, win the battle. Good. Patrick, what, what do you see as or have experienced as the sources, even with your title, as the sources of resistance to the sustainability push, to the circular economy push? Yeah, I think we, we alluded to this earlier. Uh, demonstrating the business case is not always easy and simple. I saw there was a question around, well... We're going to go to that next. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What, what is when there's a recession? Do we throw ESG out the window and go all for profit short term again? And that is, in my space, somewhat difficult to demonstrate all the time because it's a fusion of digital technology, which is novel in and by itself, and requires some transformation of the company. And then you also sustainability. I mean, Patrick, give me some... Gives a break. You're a cost. You're not a profit center. You're a cost center. And so we're really working on how do we demonstrate internally and, and externally as well the benefits. Are you a cost center or a profit center? I'm still a cost center, but I'm going to be a profit center starting next year. No, seriously. I, <laughs> I can give you the business cases. I can demonstrate internal and external profit. Did, did you sweat when, they, when you make that transition? Well, I've been with the company for about 10 years now, so I saw the old and I saw the new. I was actually fortunate enough to be on the team that kicked off the new, and, and it's not the same. I mean, it, it's really take the company, turn 180 degrees. Just, a, just the, the notion of we're going to generate money from sustainability. I mean, our, our business traditionally, sorry. Is, is crop protection products. Right. It's not what right. most people would consider a sustainable business, right? right. So, um, but we, we, we have turned this around and we have implemented a lot of digital trans or digital technology into our processes, also customer facing, growth right. facing processes that allow us to do this and generate the value. Very good. Um, we have a bunch of questions here. Un unfortunately, my, my eyesight is not good, so I hope you don't mind if I stand. And if we can blow up, we'll, we'll, we'll blow up the first one. KPIs, that's the old one. Oh, KPI. We, my God, continuity from the audience on this. <laughs> this is, this, we, you answered, you did a superb job answering that, that, that question. Greg is off the hook because he's in academe, so he doesn't have a P&L statement the same way. Who are you going to pick on now? So I'm going to pick on Marcelo and Mark again on, on, on this. Not pick on, I'm sorry, give you the opportunity. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So um, maybe I uh, answer with an anecdote. Uh, um, so when I was in Asia, working in Asia, I was selling nylon, which also go into fish nets, but uh, mine didn't. It, uh, it, it, went, it went into uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the clothing industry was one of them. Yeah? And we were trying to pitch this bio-based polyamide, bio-based nylon, to a purchaser. And uh, I went with the team, we were excited, we made a presentation, and uh, we went there and the person said, okay, but how much does it cost? Right. And then we said, well, it's this percentage more than the normal. Uh, and they said, no, sorry, thank you very much. And then they, he said something at the end, which uh, I guess my team didn't capture because they were too disappointed about the answer. But they said, look, if you come to me with a bio base that is the same cost as you know, what you have now, I will buy everything from you. So this is, is very interesting. We were in the car and then they were like, ah, oh, this is nuts. I mean, we traveled all the way over here for them to tell us this. I mean, they could have told us this before. And I said, we are missing the insight. We are missing the insight. So all these things about sustainability being more expensive, yes, there is a barrier to entry. There is a barrier of technology. There is a barrier to digitize everything. But if you get that first, you, in this case, you get the whole cake. There is a first mover advantage. There is a, absolutely a first mover advantage, and it is a tough road, and you need to balance. Yeah, the, the, you, you need to also make some degree of money if you're in the corporate environment. But I, I would say the sustainability, it is a long term. It is for the long haul. So uh, uh, one should manage the KPI on sustainability or the KPI of the company or the purpose of the company should always be that even in tough times, somehow we still need to get it done or inched a bit closer to that, yeah? So that's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to, easier to say than do, yeah? But, but we will have a test next year of a lot of these things, you know, uh, uh, going a little bit sideways. How many companies are gonna be able to keep the trajectory to net zero and hold those KPIs together? Very good. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree at all with what Marcelo said. I think all of those points are valid. I just, I just also want to say that, uh, stress on the point that 
pursuing ESG obviously is a challenge and an opportunity, but the opportunity really leads to innovation. There's, there's many innovations uh, in many of our products that are, i just give an example around, I mentioned the fishnets example, but also uh, around materials, but also around product as a service, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, by innovating things to be product as a service, we add back that circularity aspect where you know, we allow people to use our products for an extended period of time, and then we take back those products and refurbish them because things, you, this panel is all about digital, because digital is making everything transparent, trackable, more software is involved in it, so you can, through those predictive maintenance, and you assure, can model And you can model things. <clears throat> you can do the digital twin thing. You can do the digital twin, you can predict the failure, so you can re interest, trust back into the system even for these refurbished products. Is this combination of digital and desire to innovate, right, which is fueled by ESG demand, is really making a win-win situation for everyone, right? Before, before I go to the, the second question, which is one that I do want to drill down on, let me ask an unfair question. Do the boards understand this? Or do the boards look at ESG and net zero as a compliance issue, a punchless Sorry. issue? This is what the laws require. We need to be compliant. What's intriguing about the answers of all of you on, on this panel, it's intriguing in a good way, is that you're all taking the affirmative case is that, in fact, it's a good business. He's going from a cost sector to a, to a profit sector on, on this. You're talking about competitive advantage. You know, Marcelo, you were talking about the bundling and business model first mover advantage. So th there's clearly a, a let's, let's mm -hmm. turn a bug into a feature, to use a good software metaphor yeah. from that. What about the governance side, the oversight side? In terms of top management, is this seen as this is something we have to do, so we're going to manage it, or is there really a, a you know, the board, we, we, yes, we care about stakeholder capitalism, but we have shareholders too. Mm -hmm. no. okay. I, I have, I have you know, what I think is a good example here is that I did, I did mention that Schneider Electric is monitoring the uh, ESG parameters, we call, used to call it the planet and society parameters since 20, 2005. Um, I mentioned we've established uh, six uh, long-term commitments and we have a roadmap on our website called Schneider Sustainability Impact. The point I'm trying to make is that these parameters and these long-term commitments are measured on a quarterly basis, publicly um, announced, audited on an annual basis, and most importantly, all our executives and around 58,000 employees in the company, all their variable compensation is tied to these metrics, ah. and this is approved by the board. Okay. Right. That's that's Simple a pretty that. clear. Yeah, that's a pretty clear commitment on that. Is that the case in Syngenta, or not so much? Well, I'd invite you to to read some of the articles or interviews that our CEO gives. Okay. And it's hundred percent backed by the board. So the global leadership team of the Syngenta Group. They really see sustainability as a business opportunity. Right. And are hundred percent behind it. It's not to the extent, at, like at Schneider Electric, so my bonus is not tied to the successful restoration of, of land, right. but it is tied to the overall, say, performance uh, um, in, in the space of, of ESG commitments. My understanding was that there, there is some ambivalence from the mainland on to how much there, there should be commitment on, on that. I'm not aware of okay. much ambivalence in that space, but... Okay. Happy to From learn the owners. more. Okay, well, well, we'll let the talk. When you, when you work with, with boards, Greg, or when, mm -hmm. when members of boards, yep. boards of directors come to you, what, tends to, what kind of conversation do you tend to have with them? Yep. I'll give you two quick examples. The, the uh, CEO, sorry, the Chief Sustainability Officer at uh, Owens Corning was one of the founders of, um, helped us found the SHINE program okay. on net positive. And he said one of the few times that he, it was either he or his CEO got a round of applause from the board at a meeting was when they presented, we're, we're gonna include this handprint concept. It's, it's sustainability is not just about trying to disappear, it's, it's trying to get big on the positive that we're achieving. And of course, they loved it. Uh, very recently, I was brought in by uh, a board, first the, the executive team, and then they brought uh, a panel of advisors on sustainability to the board uh, for a European packaging company, and um, 
it was very engaged and they really see sustainability as strategic advantage, not, not a must do, but a, an opportunity as you framed it. For BASF, I would imagine that the government plays a big role, but the, the Vorstand probably also. Correct. What, what's the? I mean, being a Euro European corporate yeah. is already there on the regulatory side. Right. On they the don't have much choice. Society side, there yes. is a little bit of this element of the, there's not much choice, but I mean, we are in the uh, chemical space and uh, really an intermediate step for many of the other industries. So we like to think ourselves as a booster or an amplifier of sustainability for other industries, right? So. You know, you, you may remember, right. we, we, don't, don't we don't make things, we, we make, make it things better. better. Yeah. Uh, uh, and now our tagline, we create chemistry for a sustainable future. So a lot of the, you know, direction that we do, even R&D projects, if it, if it comes uh, to an R&D project for uh, approval of the board, or even when we purchase or we acquire a new company or a new business, it needs to come with a, uh, you know, carbon footprint that this would generate. And if it's negative, it's not considered anymore. That is part of the governance. Thing. Excellent. I was going to go with, with the how will a global recession impact on this right. for a nice hardball, but in the spirit of a populist revolution, we'll go with, a, <laughs> we'll go with the 49 votes one. So let's, let's and uh, count 50. Uh, 50, 50. 50. <laughs> I, I think we've been hacked, but what the heck. <laughs> I, it, it's shocking. I was going to literally ask somebody, I don't have my cell phone, I, I want a screenshot right. of that ranking we'll, with those we'll, and I'll we'll, give you we'll, my email address. We'll, we'll have the folks in the back get you that screenshot because I, 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 I agree with you on that. Sure. Now it disappeared. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, it's a reboot. Now, let's see. Let's, can you get that coming back up? I think Chad. I think we read the question. Yeah. yeah. That could be. Chad did it. Yes. Chad, that, that, Chad's that would be. in the system now. There, there we go. There it is. There we go. Yeah. Um, we won't start with you, Greg, on this, but, but I think this is clearly, I mean, what, what kind of education work? not just inside the organization, but with, we'll use the appropriate phrase here, with your ecosystem. What are the two most important educational uh, opportunities or technical, you know, sort of making things open source is great, but if people don't understand the data, does it actually help? What kind of human capital investments, training education investments, you know, partnering with edX, whatever, are you doing that might make a difference for your ecosystem? We'll start with you again, Marcelo, and then we'll go to, to Mock and, and Patrick, and we'll give Greg the last word on that one, since, you know, he was at Harvard once. So, <laughs> I mean, this is a this is a you know the the 50 volt uh, uh, question, right? right? So, uh, I mean, um, how do you get everybody on the same page? Back to this uh, uh, common language, thing, yes. common language, yeah. And it's uh, make it a you know the very insightful into the simplest common denominator, so that people can really understand this. And and this is easier said than done. But how do you put KPIs on um, you know? an intermediate step like us, and then allow an end consumer that is buying yogurt saying, okay, I understand this as well. This, this is a little bit the, the, the difficulty, but to go back to the purpose of this panel, this is how digitizing stuff really works. Once you really have a, a, a complete digital mapping of how you produce, so I give another uh, example. We have now uh, mapped out the carbon footprint of all of our products. Wow. There are some of the assumptions in that, but in principle, when you get a quality sheet from BSF, uh, uh, a spec sheet, you, you should be able to get a CO2 footprint for wow. the Wow. I the just have to ask, when was that done? This is just to finish last year. So just finished last year, it, okay. It, we are in the process of rolling it out. And, and what, what it allows us to do, because it's all digital now, is to say, you buy this from us, this cocktail of mm -hmm. products, and you want to reduce your carbon footprint on the purchase from BSF, this is how you need to maybe change your formulation, and it will not only reduce your carbon footprint from the purchase, but your formula is gonna be this much more performance driven, and it's also gonna use less so energy. It, it, and it, it creates things. consultative design opportunities. And this is the you. insightfulness, simplicity type. Very, very good. Yeah. Do you have something comparable? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, education is, is number one, right? So I, I think you have a lot of different stakeholders in the value chain. You, know, right. you have the customers. But, but you're you dealing with utilities, with, re you know, I mean, the, the, their economic incentives are not aligned with some of the opportunities you present. So I'm very curious. Absolutely. So, so you have suppliers, you have stakeholders, the governments. You, you have right. a lot of these stakeholders, and they all have to be educated. So what Schneider has uniquely done is we've established a top-tier uh, line of business inside the company for sustainability. Okay. And that sustainability business obviously has, you know, software solutions that help people uh, identify the right choice of supply, 
uh, you know, how, do you, how, do, can, how can they have the right green energy mix and all of that stuff. But they also have a consulting business, a research arm, whose primary function is to run en you know, the energy transition Is it a profit scenarios. center or a cost center? Uh, it's a support system, right? So, so the way we- Shared look, services? <laughs> Uh, it, it, is, it is a support system for the rest of the business, okay. right? So yes, there is a profit center element of consulting. We're going into businesses and, and support them in, on, in, on their journey. But we also have the mission of educating. We also have the mission of research. And that knowledge is shared as, as we bring out these solutions uh, to people. These groups are tasked with, uh, and, and some of the people uh, at MIT are involved in some, an initiative called Earth for All, yes. uh, uh, where, where some of our research is working together as well. Uh, is that the idea of running scenarios of energy transition and, and the new energy landscape and how net zero's uh, uh, goals can be achieved under various con conditions and scenarios and publishing that information, right? So, so that's one. And then obviously Schneider in the global ESG goal by 2050 has the goal of educating 80 million underprivileged individuals globally uh, on the benefits of energy efficiency, the energy conservation and things like that because the important, you talked about challenges earlier, right, you know. I talked about resistance, you resistance, translated but challenges. challenges. Well, you yes. could argue about challenges, yes. but resistance comes it's to the It's not a problem, it's an opportunity. Yes, I appreciate the rhetoric, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the thing is that half of the population is not tapped into today. Right. To be able to take advantage of the ESG things that we, and you know, the urgency that is there for ESG and uh, climate action can only be addressed if the whole world is behind this. So which means we have to have these education kinds of things. We have to bring the, the underprivileged into the, into the force to, to take action. Uh, that includes you know, gender equality and including right. uh, uh, education for all. So we're investing in all of those things to make it happen. Patrick, you have a, a fascinating global community of, of capital intensive farmers in, in, in the Netherlands to, to developing yep. world. How do you deal with the, that kind of educational thing? I, I think that is actually one of the things that you've become, you and just become much more transparent and open about. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you see that as, you know, it, what, what's the trade-off between evangelization and education and training in that regard? Yeah, we would consider it more a proposition to growers to improve their performance, financial performance and output. I mean, in some markets, it's really just, do I have food to eat? Right. Whereas in, say, the Netherlands, and use this example, it's what's my profit per hectare. Right. Um, so we have a field force, and we have dedicated teams even. Here in the US, to give you an example, we have a team that's called Sustainable Solutions that actually works with growers, actively informing them, hey, here are the results from the, the app that you use. Here are improvement opportunities, and here are what this would mean for your farm in terms of change and in terms of uh, results. To what extent do you let your farmers or encourage your growers to become autodidacts? You say, here are simulations, here's the game, you know, like what was the popular Facebook game, yeah. or, you know, like farm, Zynga, Zynga, farm, 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 that they could do that, but with quote unquote real digital twin like things so they could see for themselves the trade offs associated with this. We kind encourage of, this. Okay. We encourage it. So we Is that a metric for you? That, you know, how, um, how many engagement <coughs> they engage? Uh, we have a metric, uh, an adoption metric for the sustainability app that we have out there. Okay. So uh, I gave the, the product manager gave one, her one metric to follow, which is adoption. That's adoption. How many growers actively use this app? What's the definition of actively use? Um, well, actively use an app. I don't know how, how else would you describe this? Well. You know, I, I haven't been in, on, on a farm in about 40 years, but it, sometimes we do things daily, sometimes. Oh, you okay, know, got it, thing. yeah, okay. sure. Well, uh, this is, um, we're looking for probably once a quarter, once a month. Okay. So, give you, put this in context. Please. Um, right now, how a grower would look at this is, this is a nuisance, okay? I do this once a year, just to fulfill certain requirements. Right but I, I want to get this done once a year. I don't see this as an opportunity to improve. And that's what we want to change. Right. So that if they go in once a quarter, that's a massive improvement of where they are today. And if they use it once a month because of the seasonality of the production, and you know, there's fertilizer and there's spraying, there's hope. Right, it's a very complex process. Exactly. Right? So if they go to once a month, we'd be, we'd be quite we'd be happy. happy. Yes, so it is absolutely. a frequency and you can, of course, monitor that. Yes, absolutely. That. Greg, and I'm looking at the time. Greg, we're going to give you the last word on, on this, on education. Unless I and, and you can mention any institute of higher education that you want. In, <laughs> okay. In because, because by the way, Harvard 
there's no better farming school in America than Harvard. <laughs> well, I'll start by saying I've been teaching, like I mentioned, life cycle yeah. assessment for 25 years and doing that as a consultant as well. But LCA itself has been around for 50 years, and for 48 years the business model never changed. It was um, the software was good enough for consultants to use to make money, but scary for their clients, so that clients keep coming back to the consultants. And the software was made by consultants for consultants, but really, it's it's it, it's it was self-serving self-interest. People have told me it makes their brain hurt. Yeah. Um, and I talked about brains as the barrier to, so I think that question was so good. Um, I finally um, collaborated with some people a couple of years ago on a startup trying to get um, a tool out that is fun, that, that makes, that radically increases the accessibility of LCA. The learning curve goes way down. We, we say LCA at the speed of light, and it's, we're seeing some uptake. We're really seeing people can just get right in and do it. We have to radically increase accessibility on the digital side software. But the other piece of it is indeed scaling. I, I get 100 students um, it, you know, per class. That's not scale. So I just started a proposal for a, um, for a NetX class on LCA. But with that has to be something that we're just piloting and piloting with some folks in Europe on this is building a kind of pyramid mentorship scheme where the first students, some of them are, they're, they're invited and asked to be, become mentors for the next wave of students. Uh, they get credentials, they get more experience by, and confidence building by mentoring the next wave of students and we, we grow a community of, um, you know, increasing capability in, in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of science. So we make it as simple as possible and easy as possible, accessible to get engaged, and then we, you can make the experience easy, but there is still depth to this kind of footprint calculation, and so we have to make that also widely accessible. That's very good. So in the, I'm just, in the spirit of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna thank you very much for that last mm -hmm. word. I just wanna say that it, my takeaway from this is, it's very, very clear that, that the digital investments that you all are making yep. are forgive me, transforming transparency, traceability, and how your partners and clients and customers can play with or experiment with traceability and transparency and see these things. And, and the business challenge going forward is to what extent is this a support tool and technology versus to what extent it becomes a profit center for, for the organization. Um, People may want to take issue with that, but I'm sure our panelists will be available for those for those interactions um, later in today and in the networking session. We want to thank you for your time and attention and your questions. And Peter, we take it away on this. Thank you so much.